question three on the survey. So this was now kind of opening it up for, you know, the public opinion, letting them lay down their own, own answers here. So the question was to do with basically saying that they may not be fully aware of the reasons behind the removal of the stories, but they relate to, obviously, as we know, outdated racial stereotypes that are hurtful to people from these parts of the world or with that heritage. Um, so then knowing that information now, you know, they're equipped with that now, is there a case, as we've already kind of discussed a little bit about, is there a case that we should not be removing literature from history in order to ensure that we can learn from it? So I gave the public a little bit of an example, and that was more on the sense of imagine that you're a parent or a teacher and that those, those stories of that literature is, is no longer available. You know, So they, of course, they can still talk about it, but especially if we're talking about like younger children, sometimes it's easier to show in, in pictures as it was you know, in more kind of what we would say intelligible conversation or whatever. Um, but yeah, so... Then I went along the lines of like, you know, how would you, in the example was more like, how would you ex help to explain to a younger person the certain stories were written in a time when people were less aware or treated people much differently? So is removing these stories, and this is another kind of side chain, really. So this is, this is at the hands of the Doctors' Use Company and their, their choices. So this is a little bit devil's advocate, again, but this is, is removing these stories an act of trying to clean up the company image and forgetting about their past association with racist stereotypes. Then I let them have, you know, I said, feel free to use that, those examples or them to, you know, put in their own experience in the comments. So I'm going to go to the comments first and then I'm going to come back to you guys on that. So hold, hold your thoughts because I can see Juanita's raring to go on this. So I'm, and, and Milo as well. So, yeah, so the responses to that kind of, we we had some detailed, some not so detailed, some, in my opinion, quite ridiculous comments. So I don't know where where these people came from. Um, I don't think that I associate them with them in real life. Um, so someone said, with the best will in the world, it is historical and can be explained as such. So I don't know if they took the kind of the age grouping of people on that so much, but I think they were just generalizing that it can be explained whether there's those stories there or not. And um, someone sh strangely put, no one cares. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure you, I'm sure your mother People loves you very care. much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so, and then we had better to, yeah, better to keep them published, but explain to children and young people when reading them, what stereotypes are, and why the stereotypes are wrong. So I think that's a pretty, pretty sensible kind of comment. Um, then we had, right, so we had a really, really detailed comment here. I do like when we get some of the detailed ones. So it was so cancelling the likes of Dr. Zeus because there are outdated racial stereotypes included is counterproductive. We should use the negative stereotypes that were commonplace in a different era to either highlight how we've improved in our intolerance of different races, cultures, etc., and celebrate progress, or use it to examine where we could still improve. Some of the most important works of literature reflect intolerances, but also contribute significantly in other ways. To simply cancel rather than discuss, cancel or remove, rather than discuss is to bite off one's nose to spite one's face. So I felt that was a very, very very good detailed comment yeah that, that was that was basically my comment i just didn't you know wanted to put it in there no i'm joking oh, i'm joking i'm he's joking taking, he's, I, he's taking all the credit yeah, for that I, one now no, yeah that's not true but if i had written a comment it'd probably be very similar to that because i absolutely yeah. agree with that statement. when yeah. when i when i was reading it actually the first time it popped up and i was like well, that, that could be something that Milo, Milo could have said. But it, it only be, I, you know, the, way, the reason how you would know it was me is it would be full of grammatical errors and, and spelling errors. That's that's how you know it's for me. Yeah, that, that is not. Is not. <laughs> and then and then finally on that, just a short comment on that was just I think as long as you're aware of the context and that some of the attitudes are outdated, then then it's fine. So yeah, I'm going to bounce that back to you two. We, we've kind of touched on it a little bit already because that question about the educating people but I'm, I'm happy to kind of hear I suppose your responses to some of those public responses really 
Absolutely. I, I mentioned this earlier. It's opportunities to talk about it. And um, yeah, what those stereotypes are and to ha- ask children. Um, and, and of course, it, it, the more diverse the group of children, the more the range of responses, right? Um, how, how the language makes them feel, you know, what, how would they change it? What about it um, uh, they'd want to change? And um, I wouldn't, for me, it's like, yes, there are stereotypes. And yes, we can point out what the stereotypes are. It also, it, I think it's more important to um, take an inquiring approach to it and to find out from children what they see and how they hear it and how they perceive it. And more importantly, how that makes them feel about themselves. Because the root of all of this, and, and for me, whatever it is, you know, whatever, whether it's, you know, an image or whether it's uh, a song or God knows, there are messages in it. And, and those messages should be affirming what is best about us as human beings and should be affirming diversity and should be affirming ethics and, and, you know, all of those things. And, and along with that, children need to hear themselves and see themselves in what they read and what they watch. And so if a, if a, an Im, if a view or, um, you know, if something is being presented that, relates to them that is wrong we we need to find out what they what they feel and you know looking at kind of represent representation kind of you know as wider representation of of people you know and young people obviously because they're they're very you know they see they see that like as you said they see that content they're more likely to be the ones that are going to bring up something and say you know we as adults, regardless of where we're from, we might watch something and think, oh, that's, that seems a bit off or whatever, but we don't always pr- highlight it. Whereas kids, only in my own limited experience, but kids often tend to be the ones that will ask questions that you might not necessarily have thought of initially. Like, as you just said, you know, if there's underrepresentation of a certain culture or background and a kid's watching that program and they go, oh, oh look, daddy, you know, that, that person they don't look like me like why is why is that and it and it just opens up that initial question of like oh yeah you know why why is you know why is it just a bunch of white kids on there or whatever or if it was somewhere else in a, in a, in a, in a uh, sorry, you know, to, yeah i just remember something and <laughs> sorry um further to that so it's not not just representation it is addressing racism directly yeah. right and, and what came to mind was a conversation that we, we were it was a project we were working on a bunch of students um in sudan which is where i was teaching last and and the project was basically uh, the, the the learners had to choose which u.n sustainable development goal they cared about and wanted to respond to creatively. So one of them was, uh, it was about water and sanitation. One was focusing on racism. Here's the thing, right? Here's the thing that I want to mention. I had, in our year group, there were about 30 learners. We asked, there were two teachers, two classes. Uh, we asked the, 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 the learners to choose whichever issue they wanted to focus on. Any, we had no control over it. We said these are all the UN Sustainable Development Goals. What do you What do you care about? What which topic came up in most of the groups? Which topic? Racism. Racism came up, and my, and my colleague and I were like, "Whoa, what's 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 going on here? I hope we're not influencing them." Because <laughs> you, know? like, you don't want to do that, right? Um, no, we weren't. Um, and, and what they came up with were ra- with raps and songs and posters and, and there were a bunch of things. What I, what I is wanted to mention was this. One group created something that another group responded to 
I stood there watching these two groups having this conversation. I knew what the lyrics were of, I mean, I was listening to it as the other group was listening to it. And I could hear, okay, there's some, <clears throat> there's some stuff here that's a bit, the, uh, one of the children from the other group said, uh, mm, that's racist. Just like that, just like that. And the, and the, the child who created it was like, what, what do you mean? And, and the other guy was, that, what you just said there, that's racist. It makes me feel like blah, 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 blah. That's and great group, conversation for kids that they're in. Yeah. I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I'm really impressed with kids of that age having that conversation in, in that way. And I think adults Absolutely. in a wider scale of things actually could probably take, you know, take a lesson from that. Huge yeah. About that. Yeah, absolutely. This is why, no, this I, is why I wanted to mention it because it's not just repre representation. It's not, it is actually dissecting it and responding to it in a way that, I mean, the child who responded didn't say, Hey, you know, you're being racist, blah, blah, blah. He said, that's racist. It makes me feel like, like this. And the, the person who'd written it, then sat with the group and they re they re-examined it. They re-examined it. It was a discussion. And you know, blew my mind. You know, one of those those, those moments that was just, oh, this is why I love teaching. <laughs> <laughs> because, because children are just so they're ready. It's not to say that there's no space to make mistakes. It's not to say that there's no space to, to have um, wrong ideas or, or to be offensive. It's not to say that because we do and we're human and that happens, yet can we approach it honestly, respectfully? Can we receive the feedback? Can we make the changes? And I feel that by... The, these these books and whichever other books and whichever songs and whichever whatever it is if we can like our children respond to it and go okay that's racist and that makes me feel like that and i'd want to do this then then we, we're moving in the right direction yeah definitely i mean i've i've had not not exactly the same as that but in certain circumstances i've, I've had it with um uncles before you know that have got outdated views or opinions and i i have blatantly you know and they the thing i think that's different with adults in certain areas sometimes is when you actually do call them out on it they're they're more that ironically they end up being more shocked because i've said to people you know I, i've said but well, no that's wrong you know you're being racist like the words you're using there aren't you know aren't right and but they don't like it because it's like Everything that they knew or they, they, for some strange reason, think is right, you know, like being told now at a certain age, you know, 55, 60 or whatever. I'm not saying that's every, that age group, but I'm just going my, my own reflective experiences with, with certain adults that are within my own, you know, family unit. When I've told them that, they're being told, you know, by someone a lot younger than them, obviously, that their, you know, that their view is outdated and they need to change, you know, a little bit of the way that they're speaking. And that, yeah, often, unfortunately, they don't, you know, they don't respond in the way that you would, that how you use in your example of the, of the children that go, oh, okay, let's work together to see how we can change this. They still have this kind of entrenched view that's like quite difficult to shift. And I think that's, that's one of the things I think, Going forward, a lot of a lot of kids nowadays as well. You know, I think my niece is uh, eleven, and all her kind of age group people. You know, their conversations are they will tell people they're wrong, and if that's within their same grouping of people, and it on the largely on the largely in the main, they will they will accept that, and like you say, they will work to being progressive with it more so but the the difficulty i think is is within it's not just all older people because there's younger people that are influenced by these older people that have got these outdated opinions as well but it's quite difficult to sometimes shift even when you are directly calling them out because they then become protective strange you know protective because they know they're wrong ultimately they know that what they're saying is wrong but they've been 
enabled at some point in the past and they've taken that into their future, which I think is, that is probably, from my own personal experience, I think that is probably one of the most difficult things to kind of make progress in. But I don't know, Milo, what would, what would your kind of comments be on regarding the question? Clearly you read my comment. So I think, I think I'm <laughs> sure. there. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I, I am against the, the no longer publishing the books and not because uh, of any reason other than I think by them re- no longer publishing the books as time goes on, fewer and fewer coppers will exist. It'll be less likely to be read and less likely to be discussed. And I think in the same way, the, uh, you know, the, the Mark Twain books that I mentioned previously, if, you know, they're not getting published in all these things that might be, have these comments by, by no longer putting them out in the world, it's reducing the possibility that they'll be discussed. I mean, ignoring something doesn't make it go away. You know, it just, yeah brushes it under the under the under the uh, the carpet a little bit. Uh, let's move on to a question for you, Juanita. Okay. So back to your artistic endeavors. What has been one of your biggest challenges as an artist? So I think I've talked about this a bit already, and um, my biggest challenge has been sharing my art and accepting myself as an artist (laughs) and and um essentially yeah that's that's it and 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 there are some specific reasons for that one being um I'm in Belfast you know so I'm not in South Africa I'm not in the community that I I grew up in and um, that I experienced as being very restrictive so for me even though I was always writing and creating art. Um, you know, to be honest, I I think I went more into writing because it was easier to to shove away into books and um, in boxes that you know nobody would notice because um, there wasn't a space for it to be seen for a long time. Um, yeah. So for me, uh, the challenge, I guess, was uh, seeing that what I create has some value to others and um, overcome my own anxieties and fears about being seen and heard. And also the potential uh, hurt it can cause my family in South Africa, uh, specifically my parents, who are not comfortable about me, uh, some of my work. I mean, the stuff that, that I shared already, yeah, they'd be comfortable with that. Why wouldn't they be? It's rain. Right? Hmm. <laughs> do, you, do you find having the, the fact that, you, like you say, that, you've now kind of been more able to have that opportunity to kind of express your creativity for those channels that initially, like you say, it was kind of difficult to kind of say, oh, I'm an artist or, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing this or whatever, because it was actually kind of quite overwhelming that you've now got this opportunity to put it out there, you know, as it were, you know, and actually tell people your story and your, you know, your creative, you know, parts. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's it. I because most of so my art. I was talking to a friend about this yesterday. She's she's a poet, and she was saying that. Uh, she was, we were talking about people stepping into the shoes of other people when they write or when they when they create. And hi, that's not my art. My art is me. You know, it's like if if it's, you're seeing me in it, and uh, and that's terrifying <laughs> you know? and um and i think it was easier to not tell people about it because i wasn't ready for people to see it no I, I, and i'll tell you why i wasn't ready for people to see it because i wasn't ready to see it absolutely yeah yeah so yeah i hope i answered the question yeah no it, ma- it makes it makes perfect sense and it's interesting because it, it, it is harder to share your art when it's so personal like like that 
And because I think, you know, as an actor, right, we consider ourselves artists, but we're not ourselves when we're, when we're showing, you know, when we're sharing our art, right. We're a character, we're somebody else. Yeah. We're, you we're know, pretending as it were. Exactly. In a, in a sense, exactly. Know, versus, you know, your, your poetry and your, and your, you know, like that kind of stuff. That's, that is literally you out there for people to comment on and respond to. So that makes perfect sense. Right. We're going to make yeah. this. We're gonna go, we're gonna make this really fun now, and I know that you're gonna love this next question that oh. we've got. For you, which is, oh, I'm, I'm gonna ask this oh. one. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna take take this one. Um, so this is what is your favorite cheese? Right. So, do you know like, how some people nah. in certain cultures, <laughs> in <laughs> certain cultures, like rice is their staple diet, right? Uh, yeah. Or, uh, or um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll stop there. That's it. That's a good <laughs> enough example. Um, so cheese is uh, is I eat cheese every day. My favorite cheese is because I'm like a cheese fiend. I eat. It's like one of the, like, it's every day. <laughs> it's my staple. <laughs> Yeah. I can but list what, a few. what would you say is one of your yeah, what would you say is one of your one of your favorite if you've got one favorite, not you know, you might have to kind of coin it down to two or three or whatever, but what would you say is one of your favorites? See, I could just be made very, very happy, like extremely happy with some extra mature British cheddar. <laughs> wow, you live in the right place for that then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can not, not be not be anywhere else. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I I joke yes. about that in living here. It's like, hmm, which type of cheddar shall I have today? <laughs> shall I have the aged cheddar or the British cheddar or the red cheddar? <laughs> oh yeah, a bit of red, bit of red luster. Red luster, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's funny. That's awesome. So, are there any other? Are there any other cheeses? Because obviously, you said that you, you know you like the extra mature British British cheddar. Oh yeah, I love uh, uh, Red Leicester. I love Brie. I love Camembert. <laughs> I love <laughs> I love stinky blue cheese. I, I, I reckon. <laughs> I reckon that you you literally are. We're not going to get a favourite out of you because it's just you like. Cheers, this is. But you, you said something about because you worked in Sudan. So did you ever? Was it you know, was it ever difficult to get hold of? Because I don't know what the cheese culture is like in Sudan. You know, I've never, yeah, never so, been so, there. So. Yeah, actually, there's there's quite a lot of um, they have these cheese straws. I, I tried them. One, there, there's there's a lot of local cheese, right? Um, which do you mean I, like che- do you mean like cheese strings? Yeah. Do you mean like cheese strings or actual cheese straw, like the savory cheese straw things? No, I mean like actual strings. Of cheese. Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> but when I lived in Sudan, I my, my staple cheese uh, consumption would be those little uh, uh, triangular. Um, what do you call them? Oh, the um, dairy. I think they are. There it is. I think yeah, we do. There's, there's like the laughing cow do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, that one, that one. Yeah, they're that's, kind that's... of. Basically, I don't know if you know, Milo, the UK seems to have this, even though they obviously make a lot of cheeses, they have this real association, a bit like, you know, how I always talk about kind of like in America, like a lot of people love plas- what I would call plastic cheese, you know, like the cheese squares. I call it, yeah. fi- I call it fake cheese, yes. Yeah, so. Fake cheese. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah, plastic cheese, whatever you know, just like you could, you could, ch- you could chuck it on the side for mm-hmm. a month, <laughs> yeah. and nothing, nothing would have touched it. It would have just been there, and it looked the same. It's so <laughs> embarrassing that that's like American cheese, and you're like, really? So like the cheese yeah, but, named but after but our everyone... country is like fake cheese. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, not like not like a bit of Monterey Jack. Exactly. Just, There's nothing. It's like yeah. uh-huh. fake cheese. Fake yeah. cheese. Um, there you go. Fake American cheese. cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> But now it's like it, that's quite a UK staple, shockingly as well. I think I think the whole fast food element probably plays a part in that. To be fair, but no, de- so Dairyly Cheese Triangles, which is what um, Juanita could only get whilst in in Sudan, is basically kind of like almost like a really soft processed cheese. 
that basically melts before you even look at it. Oh, um, okay. So their marketing strategy is great because it's like, oh, here's a box of cheese. Open it up. Oh, it's not there. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost evaporated. Melts in your hand. Yeah, and it's in these little foil, kind of peely foil things. I don't know if there's anything similar like that. Are those in really America. small, like little, yeah, little yeah, square? Yeah, tiny. Yes. Tiny, really I know what salty you're talking about. kind of. Yes, I have yeah. had that. I don't, yeah. I don't think they're even cheese, to be honest. I think they're just a little block of very soft. Yeah. Cheese, cheese, cheese flavored product. Yes. Yes. I know what yes, you're talking about. Yes. Cheese flavored. Cheese it, it goes flavored well on it. crackers I mean, though. I, I will give you that. Like, like they go really well with like crack little crackers and, and stuff. I think you just kind of take it out of the wrapper, squeeze it on your little cracker and eat it. Yeah. I think like on a, on a, um, oh, like a little Ritz or something. Yeah, exactly. You know, like something little, like that. I think yeah, it Whack that on them. Just, just, just more so, you know, just. So, so I should tell you about che- my cheese crackers. They're just slices of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> there's no cracker <laughs> just a cheese an actual yeah. cheese wedge you know just <laughs> take the fake cheese and put it on a, a piece of cheddar and the, ch- the, the cheddar is your cracker and then the fake cheese is the cheese perfect a stacker yeah, that's yeah. The... cheese stacker or che- cheese slider maybe even. you know just pure Ooh, cheese because <laughs> i know milo likes um Talking about cheese-based products, just to open it a tiny bit more. I know Milo loves these kind of like cheese square things, which in the UK they're called cheeselets. And I, I, I might be in cardinal sin here because I know that cheese it is oh is cheese crackers, a, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is Have I talked about cheese thing. crackers with you before? Is that no, but I've seen I've seen you either with a box or something like kind of. Yes, oh, I've it's true, some, yeah. Um, and I know that you're a big fan. I am, but yeah. we do do something similar here called cheese lips. They're not the um, same. I, that's what I was going to say. I might have been cardinal <laughs> sin. I might have been. He's yeah. like, no, no. There, you, there can be only do one. Do not shit on me. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, there like, can be only <laughs> one cheese at cracker. All everything else is cheap imitation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I knew that was okay. Under the, under response. But, it's it's funny. Yeah. Anytime anybody comes and visits me from the U.S., they are required to bring a box in them. <laughs> my for my birthday last year my girlfriend ordered a giant box full of little bags of cheese at crackers like that lasted wow. for half the year yeah so i thought you were gonna say like two weeks because yeah. you just <laughs> it, it easily could have i had to put the box yeah. in the closet so i wouldn't see it because i definitely would have kept yeah, lo- eating locked, them. locked away and yeah. just kind of like yeah okay i'm bringing out the cheese at no but i'm delicious i should be a spokesman for cheese at crackers i talk about them so much they, they should I, pay I'm... me I reckon you could, you know, I reckon, get the show to sponsor us. Yeah, there we, we go. We've, we've said the word enough now. I think that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Rip It Up, sponsored by Cheese It Crackers. Che- <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hey, we, we've, we've nailed it. Yeah. yeah so let's, <laughs> uh, let's get back on track. Uh, what is question four on the uh, public questionnaire? Yeah. Cap? So, yeah, indeed. Uh, Fourth, and it was the final question on the survey that we asked the public. So this was now kind of leading off to kind of more the creative area, which we've kind of started to touch on a little bit. So I asked the public here, which was, which was, so in the creative world, how has it now become quite difficult to express anything without offending someone or something? So, you know, in that wider scale, again, relates to the cancel culture, also comes back around just and knits in with creativity quite well. So, my example, just to just to you know to let them kind of have a little opener, was that so of course any racial stereotyping is unacceptable, um, but looking at the wider picture, does this mean that today we're more unable to create something that by the time it makes say the final cut, it's been stripped of any personality, humour, satire, and so on because we're kind of being so conscious of what we're of what we're writing, we're not actually writing what what is truly there, and especially if we're then publishing it and it's going out to you know a, a huge audience. Um, so I furthered on that and said we aren't talking anything that's intentionally you know really offensive and provocative. But as we evolve within the world of cancel culture, are we eventually going to kind of suppress creativity to a point where everything ends up kind of replicated and looks the same or is kind of like sanitized or sterile? Um, so by design, are we? in some ways, slowly dis- destroying creativity. Um, so then I stress the point that this isn't to enable people to in, to, who intend to spread hate, 
Um, it's more focusing on the wider evolution of creativity. And I let them put in their comments on that. So we did have, again, several comments and some were a little surprising when I when I read them. Um, I think there was just one person in there that, like you say, in that kind of cancel culture, trolling kind of nature, I think somebody else who just went on and decided that they were going to put something a bit stupid. But I'll, re- I'll read it, you know, and we'll uh, we'll think of them. Um, so, yeah, we got, so somebody put, um, I fail to understand how other people can set themselves up as judges as to what other people may find perfectly acceptable. Who judges the judges? Yeah, it took me a while to process. I think that's, they're basically saying, you know, like can can people say, oh, that's that's bad for some on behalf of somebody else? I think that's what they're kind of getting at. It's like you know, you're kind of you're doing it. Sometimes you get people online and they're saying, you can't say that. That's bad. You know, that, that's that's wrong. Which is right in the calling out sense. But sometimes are they doing that on on behalf of others to be kind of what we would term as say um, woke or whatever? I suppose would be the kind of that's the that's usually the insult or whatever that's used by trollers and things like that would say oh you oh are you being woke in that sense because you're you're maybe trying to speak on someone else's behalf when their angle might actually be very different to that and they're just kind of they're being offended for somebody rather than the actual individual so that that's their their one um then we got um somebody said yes i think it does kill creativity when there is a fear of being cancelled i've likened it before to the uh, Gestapo so that if you if you put a foot wrong you might disappear so you walk on eggshells all the time just in case cancel culture also doesn't seem to accept apologies like we touched on earlier on and I think people need the space and freedom to make errors apologies and learn and then move and then be able to move on from them I thought that was quite a quite a good reference point there on that one um, then somebody else put if cancel culture, sorry, if cancel culture is supported by the majority, I think it'll stifle creativity. But then they said, I don't have a good example or any advice, though. So, um, but that was their, their pure opinion was just they think that if cancel culture is supported by the majority, I think it'll stifle creativity. So it's probably a fair point. Um, yeah, then somebody puts, um, yes, wokies need to get a grip. Not really a helpful comment, not very constructive, but, you know, there you go. It's a public response, so we have to accept we're going to get certain comments from people. Um, And then we've got quite a a detailed one here. So someone says, frankly, I do not believe that even racial stereotyping should be out of bounds for comedy. Stereotyping, even if unfair, lends itself to the logical structure of many good jokes, jokes. And unfortunately... There's an inevitable byproduct that people may be offended. That doesn't mean it's okay to purposely target it and bully somebody, but if a joke is good, it's demonstrably good, whether it's offensive or not. What's more, it's possible to be offended by literally anything. I'd rather risk causing offense than be so so terrified of saying the wrong thing that I say nothing at all. Then they go on to give an example personal to themselves. They said, being ginger... I can honestly say I've never been offended by a ginger joke. My favorite was, and they said, Adam had use for a frisbee. He just needed a boomerang. Okay. So that was their, their one on that, yeah? Mm-hmm. I, I don't get the joke. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think, I don't think the, the, um, the commentator was particularly offended by it. They're like, oh, that's, that's mm. the best you've got. You know, kind of, <laughs> <laughs> other than the usual kind of, oh, look, ginger guy or whatever, you know. Um, so, and then the last one on there that we had was, they said, I think if you want to create something, it is more difficult to publish it. But at the end of the day, in the era we live in, someone won't like it and someone may take offense. As long as you know you didn't intend to upset anyone, then I guess you can or you should feel all right about it. So I think that's just kind of, yeah, using that kind of context element again that, as long as you personally know that you're not going out there to offend somebody, I yeah, I I can see you've got we can't suppress creativity, but 
we do need to have a place where we're kind of we're learning from the things that we say. So I think we have got like like you said before, we've got to be um, reflective. We've got to be representing other people and not just ignoring them. And then also, like you said before, also directly calling out racism. So the question doesn't kind of aim to enable anyone that's kind of spread, you know, hate. But I think it's more talking about the the, the overarching, you know, kind of suppression of creativity as a whole. So yeah, I want to take you guys opinions on that one so i think that um on the flip side of things i was thinking about the many artists uh many uh activists um who spoke out against things through art and yeah in many many countries still today and don't go don't make it back home yeah because that's the the you know they live they live in military states and i spent some time living in one um and i spent some time living in the philippines which is wasn't a military state when i lived there yet it is fast bec- bec- has become one in terms of freedom of expression and you know on the flip side it's there's what is what is popular or what is acceptable or what is um, you know the wave the tide and then there's the truth and the truth is the truth and art has always been an artist have always uh, for me I guess I, I see it as that responsibility to to speak that in the various ways of, that that it is spoken um and so you know on, on on this extreme of would cancel culture kill creativity uh one of the things that came to mind w- with one of the comments was um <laughs> trevor noah <laughs> you know, i just thought of trevor noah <laughs> and, and i thought of a bunch of other south african comedians who i love and who will completely uh take the piss out of, out, out of themselves because that's what they do. And, and oh yeah, it's full of stereotypes. Oh yeah, it is very much so. It's their own. It's their own. So it's standing in my own stereotype or in my own context and laughing at it. You know? and, and it's different from... Mm, it's different when when you're doing that uh, to somebody else, and 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 a lot of South African comedians have done this over the years um, with race racial topics, and I promise you, I've sat in crowds where I feel that these guys standing up there saying these things that just if you can't not laugh, and then your face hurts. And it's so true. And it's all part of the calling it, calling the racism and changing the narrative. And in between, we surely can and need to laugh at ourselves and accept that we've been wrong and racist about certain things and accept that and see that and start to change. It's different though, when, when you're... When, yeah, when it's about somebody else, when it's about a different group. So there's that, there's that thought. But uh, I, I still do believe that uh, it's 2021. And I think we have a greater responsibility in terms of the racial narratives. There, it's, it's really important uh, that we... What I, you know, if, it, how do I say this? Um, especially for material that is in schools and with children, because children need to see themselves. And especially for Black children, when most of the narrative has said, 
you're 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 less than then the, then it, it needs to change because um because children are very much affected by it today up to now so i i'm not sure i have a definitive um, view on whether cancel culture could kill creativity i i, I think it can and i think it is in a lot of ways, but maybe not. I, um, I did an interview not long ago with a girl who's from, uh, where is she from? Uh, Iran. Sorry. She's from Iran. And she was telling me like prior to the Iranian revolution, they were in, uh, they were reasonably, you know, liberal in a lot of ways. And then of course, you know, they had the revolution and everything becomes very conservative. And she was telling, and so I thought she was going to take the view that that was actually a bad thing. And her point was it actually forced artists to be more creative with their art in order to get their message out. And so by, a lot of that behavior in essence being canceled by the conservative government, artists have to come up with more interesting and unique ways of getting messages out, you know? And so could it be now that we're leading into that where, so you're not going to get a, div, you're not going to get really a good message from Hollywood, right? They're going to make cookie cutter films that are designed not to offend anyone, but Will we now see other artists being more creative and getting messages out, you know, in regards to topics such as, you know, Black Lives Matter and all this other kind of stuff that then, you know, gets the message to us via a less direct, but better method. So, um, so yes, cancel culture is canceling creativity, but it also is potentially forcing creativity to be, or creatives to be more creative in how they get their message out. I, I think that's so interesting that she said that. And, um, and I think this goes back to what I would, to the activism aspect as well, because, you know, uh, it's not like, for, for, for many artists in those contexts, it's not like the art is being exhibited in a gallery. Oh my gosh, this is, you know, stuff that needs to get out there and the messages need to get out there, right? And so uh, absolutely, um, you know, when, we, when, you, when you think of it in that, well, when I'm thinking of it right now in that sense, w w what is the, 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 di the mechanism or the, what is, can what is cancel culture doing? It's, it's saying, we're not going to listen to you or you don't have, you don't have a, a platform anymore because of that in, in the past or because of this, we, we, we disagree. Basically, we disagree with you. And, and in, in uh, countries where you know, there are these e absolute extremes, that is what the, the, the main, the, the, that's the major dynamic. That's, it's, so that sense of going against, oh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I just feel that uh, I, I hope that it does lead to more creativity, like the artist from Iran hopefully. was saying. I mean, ho yeah, hopefully it doesn't lead to people being too scared to say what they have to say. I've, I mean, I, I, I know Kevin knows this because we talked about it in when we, I think we had one of our previous episodes to where I feel concerned about being canceled for something I've said or something I unintentionally say via, cause I, you know, do podcasts, I write, I do all this stuff and, and I'm reasonably open with what I say. And there's, and I know people are offended constantly at pretty much anything. And so I, I certainly have that fear and I check what I say much more now than I did say maybe 20 years ago. And, and to whereas before I, I would view it as just kind of my opinion and, and be discussion. Now I think, okay, I'm, I might say this as my opinion, but, or who's going to be offended by it. Cause I know it'll offend somebody. And then how is their offense by what I just said going to negative impact me in some way. And then yeah. I then often won't say 
what it, uh, and and I've edited stuff out of this podcast that we we I we did one and I'll, I'll kind of reference I made a joke about Ireland because I lived in Ireland I for six was, years yeah, yeah, I mean, this is what I was getting for yeah <laughs> so I made a joke about Ireland which which uh, it was funny and and I think my Irish friends would get the the joke right but anybody who doesn't know me would be like well that's really offensive towards Irish people right and so I cut that completely yeah. out because yeah, I knew get in, get in the get in the bin Milo you know exactly <laughs> so so I cut it completely out because I knew people would be offended by it so I'm in essence editing myself out of fear of the consequences that are, that are going to happen to me which kind which kind of relates to a little bit to what I touched on earlier about the kind of the, the teen Vogue editor, um, Lexi Mc, McCammond, different, different set of tweets, but, you know, actually that kind of historic, you know, historic things that you've done and said, like you say, you're, you're now, obviously you're, you're very aware of what you're doing, but like you say, you're actually having to edit the things that you're saying as well. You, you guys have got me thinking about something. Um, what you were saying about editing and, and being, you know, thinking of how it is received, perceived and, and all of that. So um, I, for me, and I think I mentioned this earlier. So uh, one of my challenges has been that some of my stuff is about topics that my family is not comfortable with to the point where I know that and have been, yeah, um, I've put st- stuff out that, people find uh, hurtful. Not that not, that was my intention. Not that was not my intention. My intention was to uh, address an issue that I think is so rife in so many homes, right? And um, so what I was getting at was, I, I think I I re I think I think I spend most of my my life as an artist creating stuff and not putting it out, knowing what the impact would be. And reaching a point of the truth is the truth. And I have a responsibility as a survivor. I have a responsibility to children. I have a responsibility to protect children. And so I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to, I'm willing to accept those consequences. Now, so I think as artists, yes, okay, you know, we, 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 what we put out could be hurtful and offensive to somebody. Yet, if it, truth hurts, <laughs> right? It's not. It's not to say that you know we're, we're doing something to hurt people, but but to accept where we've been wrong is a painful thing, and which is why most people are, tend to hold on to being right when they're wrong. But um, well, speaking of art and performance, why don't we jump into your last performance piece for us? Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. Um, oh wait, I think give me a second. I need to just check that I have. All right, so I have two short pieces here. The first one is um, a poem and a self-portrait um and it's about reclaiming the child um which uh, i i created the, the artwork last august and the poem was i think in early march and then uh, there's a what i follow that with is another short they both very short pieces yeah the, the second one is um um, I guess a continuation or the next step uh, uh, that followed after naming myself as a survivor of childhood sexual trauma and accepting that that I am responsible for the child within me, that there's a woman <laughs> here too who ha- um, has had fears of intimacy and um, is honest about that. So yeah, so those that's what the pieces are about with me. I found life there. Coffins are meant to hold the dead where bones and skin turn to dust. Yet I found life there in coffin where child had died, had died, had died and lived. 
Although I left and went far away, seeking, searching, hoping, I found life there in the place that I loathed, too ashamed to say, this is me. When coffins are closed, they're not meant to reopen. Who wants to see loved ones decomposing? Yet I found life there. When I opened the lid and said, I'm here now, I won't leave you. Although I judged and wished you away, you in coffin, you were always my undoing. Undoing of lies and the shame of existence. You live. We live. I live. Come lie with me. Come lie with me like mist. Come lie with me like fire. Come lie with me in love. Come lie with me with desire. Where I was closed, I am now open. Where I was lost, I am now found. Where I was wounded, I am now healing. Where I was afraid to go, I am now bound. So lie with me in sunlight. And lie with me under the moon. Come lie with me forever. Come lie with me, please, soon. I had to unmute myself. I started applauding and then realized I was still muted. <laughs> do, you, is your, do you have a book of poetry out, Juanita? Because um, just those two pieces so far are fantastic. And if you have a, if you had a book of poetry out, uh, I would absolutely get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I really love the, um, I really love like the illustrations there as well. Like, I think they're amazing. And this was the reason why I thought Juanita was actually an illustrator. I was like, the, the, the way that that's all put together though, as well, as Milo says, if you had like a book, I would certainly. Yeah. I mean, that may buy that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I've been, uh, so, so to answer your question, I hope to soon. So I've been putting my, my work together um, into collections and um, I'm talking to two publishers who... Uh, I'm yeah. sure it's hard to get a book of poetry published, I would imagine, because I know... Um, a guy I know did a kind of like a, a self-help type advice book and it was really well written. I read it, but cause he wasn't a known name. He didn't have a TV show or anything, you know? And so no, no publishers wanted it. And so I'd imagine it's probably very similar to poetry because it's such a niche market that if you're a known, you know, poet or whatever, they're like, yeah, but if, if you're not as, not as well known, it's probably harder, harder to get a publisher. I would imagine. Yeah, I guess. I mean, um, like I said, I'm my first open mic was uh, in January. <laughs> I'm really new to sharing um, my work. And at the same time, I have tons. I have tons because <laughs> I'm just uh, from, from a from a purely performance point of view. You know, you would not. I mean, and, and to be honest, going forward, my only tip would be don't even mention that you've not done much before because you're the way that you present through is like you've been doing it for years online and i'm sure you've obviously presented in the past as a teacher and things but in terms of being kind of um you know intimidated or whatever by the whole kind of showcasing that online or to other people i mean personally i would not say that that you know when i've seen your stuff now you know the two or three times now i mean that is I wouldn't say that you, you know, I'm not looking at that going, oh, there's stuff. I, I know people that present stuff and have done hundreds of stuff and they make absolute, you know, tons of, tons of kind of technical cock-ups or whatever. And you kind of just go straight in and, and, and you're there, you know? So, yeah. 
going forward, <laughs> definitely just be, just go with it, and you, you're great. To be fair. So, so Kev, yes, I've been a school teacher, and I've been, uh, you know, I've been extremely misconfident when it comes to, you know, doing stuff in terms of all of that, and because it's the nature of it, I think. When it's my stuff, like my stuff, this is my stuff. It's different. It's different. And I'm so, I'm a bag of nerves. Um, however, um, I, I, I don't know, people, I've had some, some, some interesting comments. Somebody asked me a few weeks ago, are you an actress? <laughs> 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 like, no, I'm not an actress. I'm just like this. This is me. <laughs> Well, because you seem very, I think it's, yeah, because you seem very comfortable, uh, you know, presenting, which is probably why. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be a, going to be a good thing in some respects, because, you know, I say that the way that you come across within, like I just mentioned, within your kind of presenting of your material is, you know, as professional as anything, really. I mean, much better than that. I could ever be. Here's my kind of self-deprecation moment. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, but, you know, fantastic. Seriously, yeah. But, you know, I think that, uh, and this is why I, did, I was uncomfortable about doing it before, because it's, uh, I, I just feel so plugged into whatever that is. It's, I, I'm just feeling it. I'm just feeling it. That's all that I'm doing. And that's all, that's all that there is. And I'm sharing that. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know how to not feel it. <laughs> Sorry, does that make sense? No, I mean, it, it just makes, the thing is, it, even though it is believable because you're sharing your own personal stuff, it does, it just makes it even more believable anyway. You know, no one could kind of doubt what you're, what you're putting out there. They could just be like, wow, this is really engaging. And obviously for a lot of people, very, very relatable. But talking about presenting and stuff, we are going to go and move on to like our final, final kind of, little kind of mini feature thing, which is where you get an opportunity to turn the tables. We've been asking you questions and, and whatnot, and you get a chance now to ask ask Milo. So this is our Ask an American feature. So take it away. Yay! Yay! So, <laughs> Milo! My, Milo's most favourite part <laughs> of the show. So, Milo, I mentioned earlier that I love cheese, and I also mentioned that I love trees. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and paint yes. cheese and trees. <laughs> Ooh, I just had an idea of painting with cheese. <laughs> there oh you my go. God. Ooh, smart. Oh no. That, that's a system. trees by cheese. There you go. <laughs> so my question, my question for you mm-hmm. is where and when Lars did you meet a remarkable tree? When did I last meet a remarkable cheese? Not cheese, oh, trees. trees. <laughs> Boy, okay, I guess we could talk about trees if you really want. <laughs> when last did you meet a remarkable tree? And, tree. and that's, yes, so that could be in Seattle, Dublin, or London. And it's a tree that. A tree, like not a, not a cheese, a tree. <laughs> Yeah, not a, not a cheese tree, okay. you know, with, like, with all dangling made of cheese. Kind of, yeah, plastic yeah. cheese. Mm-hmm. A bit of a tree cheese harvest. <laughs> that invited you to look up okay. and breathe deeper. Mm-hmm. Just a tree. A tree. tree. A tree. Yes. Okay, let's see. What comes to mind first? Um, the first... First thing that pops into my head is probably going to be I did a road trip. So this is no, oh, this is the most recent. I'm sure there's probably more recent, but this is the first thing that pops into my head is the uh, redwood forest in California. Driving through that, you know, because the, they're just massive. Like it's you, you've you, been there. Yes, I mean there, there's, you, you, there, I mean they're so large you could, you know cut a hole and drive through them and yeah one of my one of my sisters has, has been and yeah it, i can't personally you know fathom the size because i've not been stood i've seen pictures and things but yeah i mean it's it's utterly remarkable it's they're they're they're, they're located they're in the right perfect position to where they're getting the the you know the the weather coming off of the ocean and then the you know so they're just these 
and they're, they're, they're straight and tall and just massive. And it's really utterly beautiful. Um, so I, that's certainly not the most recent, but that's the first thing that pops into my head when you oh, ask that question. Was, was that in Yosemite or was that in Yellow, Yellowstone? Oh, Yellowstone. Um, Yellowstone has interesting um, dead trees. So they've got a lot of um, their, you know, when they die and they get uh, calcium in them, you yeah. know, so they become uh, Putri- Putri- petrified. There Putri- we go. Yeah. yeah petrified. Yeah. So, you, uh, so there's a lot of really cool old petrified trees in Yellowstone uh, that are really interesting seeing. But, but for me with Yellowstone, it was all about the hot springs. They're just, they're, they're, they're just so clear and so beautiful that you really want to touch them. And you can't because you would burn your skin <laughs> off. But and it's and I'm surprised how that they actually do let you kind of walk right up to them in a lot of places and just get real close and look into this just crystal clear water that that I you know I I, I can't imagine that a parent couldn't could not have their child un controlled when they're there. Cause I imagine as a child, you would literally just want to like stick your hands in this beautiful thing. And uh, so a parent would have to be constantly controlled. It's that's, yeah, that's, that's what I think of when I think of Yellowstone. Um, but wow. the trees is, yeah. well, in terms of trees, yeah, the, the redwoods would be the, um, wow. yeah, here, um, we did a road trip up to Scotland a couple of years ago and it was really lovely. There was a lot of lovely, like, you know, forestry there and just the greenery and stuff like that. Um, yeah, Ireland, unfortunately, they've chopped down all of the the trees and have, you know, obviously they're regrowing them now, but, uh, but they don't have that kind of aged look to them in a lot of places. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so Scotland here would probably be what I've seen. Yeah. There's a good, there's a good chunk of places in England and Scotland yeah. and probably Wales as well, actually, where there's, you know, some really, really old gnarly, So, so to our audience here, the reason why I'm always getting stuck being asked the question here is, uh, Kev works with our, our excellent guests, uh, and, and finds them and, and puts a lot of like pre-work into the show. And and so I, I, I don't meet our guest until we actually start recording, uh, which is why the question always gets asked to me, but I'm going to put it on the fly here and I'm going to call an American at it asks a British person, a question and, uh, or ask a Brit, well, I'll call it for short. And, uh, <laughs> so in recent news, why was Prince Philip always considered a prince and not a King? If he married a queen. Oh, you, you can help him if he goodness. needs, if he needs yeah, help on this, I, but uh, I am because I'm not, I am in no way a royalist. Uh, <laughs> you may want to guess that. <laughs> Although I've got Henry VIII kind of. You got um, the beard going. Yeah, pushing, you're working pushing on it. The, pushing that yeah, way. Yeah. Um, I think it's. I think it's something to do with kind of like consorts within the whole royal setup. Um, people are going to watch this. All kind of twenty people are going to watch this and go and, <laughs> and go. Now nah, that guy's talking up. To you, you should be ashamed um, to call yourself an Englishman. Yeah, well, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I, or proud, yeah, I should, or proud, or proud. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I, sh- I say I should, I should be kind of exported away. You know, it's literally that's it. You know, take it, take him away, banish him from the kingdom of the, of UK or whatever we want to call it. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't really give you a straight answer on that. It's more, but I think it is it is down the lines of to do with consorts um, and the actual the bloodline as well. So I think the queen is from that main branch, as it were. So she gets that. But it's weird because obviously years and years ago you could only like now they've changed it in the monarchy. Where so say if I think so next in line to the heir of the throne after Prince Charles will be um, William, you know William and Kate. So, but they did change it that if their firstborn was a daughter, so William and Kate, had they had a daughter, she could have become queen. She wouldn't have had to marry, you know, someone else within the royal line. So when William becomes a king, will she become a queen? Or will she be can still be considered a princess or something like that in the way Philip is a prince? So she would become queen consort, as it were. Mm-hmm. So like she wouldn't be the actual queen because he would take the ruling 
or the leading rule or whatever. So he'd become king. She'd just be queen consort. I think that's what they call it. Um, but their child, had their first child been a, um, a female or whatever, then they she would have then automatically become queen, you know, and they wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have, it used to be, no, it would be say, like say they had three daughters and then, you know, like years ago, it's like, no, you've got to produce a male because you've got to produce a male heir. Now all that would be bypassed. So it would just be like, okay, you've got your fourth child's a male, but your first three were female. So the first female born, that's fine. You know, okay. they can be, they can queen. But that, that's the thing that they changed. There was no, no, like overriding the females, as it were, for him to just then choose the male um, offspring. But yeah, in terms of Prince Philip, I don't know because uh, to be honest, our royal family is about as th- this is my own opinion. Mm-hmm. But the royal family is about as English as I don't know, cheese it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, there's there's very and, and yet then you get you know people that are very kind of that try to make out that they're very patriotic or whatever, and they have no recognition of the, you know the royal family being you know I think they're just like this kind of English, this pure English bloodline or some bull, but no. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Milo, Philip, Milo, was your question answered? Not really. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think he was in the ballpark, but certainly I don't think he, I, I, I'm sure. Yeah. There's somebody. Sorry, that, Kevin. Yeah, clearly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just Google, Google as your friend or, or, the, or your preferred search engine of For, choice. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to be uh, it. I'm going to be it to everybody. I'm going to duck, duck, go it. Duck, duck, go no, it. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to duck, duck. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, I couldn't answer that. Um, That's okay. But what we can we can kind of close with kind of I'm just going to give it a kind of generalizing you know final final thought from from all of you. So yeah, Juanita, in terms of the whole cancelling, removing Doctor Zeus, what would you say your final kind of thoughts are on that whole that and the overriding subjects and questions? I think that this, as well as um, all the um, big events recently uh, relating to to race, uh, opportunities to um, take bigger, bolder, braver steps towards the truth. <laughs> Essentially, that's what I think. <laughs> that was good. Cool. That was I, that was very yeah. dramatic in the delivery. I liked it. <laughs> yeah, very poignant, very very um, concise as well. Um, so, um, Milo, you, yourself on the matter? Yeah, I mean, I uh, in regards to the whole pulling it off shelf, I think I kind of said it that one. I'm I'm not a huge fan of the idea, but the flip side of that is it has gotten people talking about it. So. You know, in way, maybe it, I don't know if that was their intent when they pulled the books. I think it was just, they were worried about future cancel culture going after them, but the un, the unintended intent is that people have been having discussions like ours tonight, which I think is for the benefit or for the good. Yeah. I think absolutely. I think my kind of, my main takeaway really is more that kind of opportunity to kind of learn and, and listen to to the people that matter when it comes to these kind of subjects as well, because if we can only kind of move forward and have a broader, wider opinion, like you say, that kind of circle, as it were, you know, widening that and, and it just got, yeah, my takeaway is I've learned that, you know, you need to be able to listen to more people rather than just holding an individual opinion about it and kind of including as many people as possible. But that, could could yeah, we no Sorry, could we start a new a new hashtag that's cancel cancel culture? <laughs> so mm? I, I reckon there's a there's a space for that. Yeah, yeah that's that's the one I want to start. All right, uh, thank you uh, so much for letting <laughs> yeah. us monopolize your time, Juanita. Last question, we promise, which is of course, uh, if people want to find you or any works that you're working on that you want to make people aware of, social medias like uh, that kind of stuff. 
Um, See on Instagram or Twitter or I, TikTok? I, no, 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 TikTok. <laughs> I am <laughs> on Instagram. It's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's just Juanita underscore Ray one. I think that's my Instagram. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess, um, have you got yeah. an upcoming event? Uh, anything that you're gonna be you're gonna be in that people can kind of tune into? Oh and, yeah, and I'm actually doing a um, feature set at Blot from the Blue uh, at the end of May. So what is it called? Blot from the Blue. Blot so that from the Blue. Is, yeah, I believe. Yeah, Thin like holes. a block from yeah, like a block from the Blue is actually you no know, thing that we had on a few weeks back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. the show. That's, that's, his, that's his show. Okay. Yes. So oh, excellent. At the end of May, I'm I'm the guest special mm-hmm. guest. I think. Sure. Do you know um, the Do you know the dates? The, I think it's the thirtieth of May. There are a couple of other, you know, um, possibilities, but nothing's been been fixed. Uh, as oh yeah, there's another one. Also, the end of May. I think the 29th of May. Um, a, a guest artist on. The Duke Special Gramophone Club, and that's a Belfast-based um, artist. And I'm going to be doing some spoken word music stuff. Soon. Are these so, and is that virtual? Both of it. But yeah, virtual, yes. Okay. Duke's. Yeah, I was going to say because some some more. We're going to start. You know, again, we're going to get people start. Yeah, yeah, saying that actually, you know, these events that I'm doing are. You know, real ones, you know, like we said before, what's a gig, you know, kind of thing. It's uh, actually yeah. going, going to events and, and participating yeah. in them. And so, are, yeah, you, no. are you looking to do live gigs when they open up? Since I know it's just kind of, you've mostly just been doing virtual now, but in front of that crowd and. Yeah, I am. I'm terrified. I know that I've been extremely lucky and in that I've kind of stepped into, onto the performance stage in my bedroom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right here. So it's been very safe. And it's been good for me because I um, I know that I'm feeling a lot more confident. Uh, I, I think it's mostly that I know that I'm a bag of nerves and I can navigate that bag of nerves. <laughs> you know? So that's what, that's not going to go away. Right. But I've had enough opportunities to, to yeah, step into it. And so, yes, I really um looking forward to being an absolute wreck on a stage live sometime soon <laughs> all right i mean it's great you know it's great preparation really is one way to look at it it's just that you know all this online stuff is just fantastic prep really you can't you can't replicate it fully but it can at least get you kind of literally prepared ready for an actual live show so i can't i can't wait if anyone wants to book me, um, I, can't <laughs> yeah. wait, I can't wait. Should that happen? Yeah. To actually start, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was like, still, still, still waiting. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> still waiting. Um, uh, well, let's, sorry, Kev, uh, let's wrap no, this no. up. Uh, Juanita, we have monopolized way too much of your time, um, but it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, mm, you're super you. fascinating. And uh, I, I loved your poetry. I really, really did. If I didn't, I would just say thank you. And that was nice. So that's how you know. <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely fantastic. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. And thanks for, thanks for taking part. And you, you did have a lot to say on the matter, as it were. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Right? Yes, yes very, I did. Very yes. Uh, educational too. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> But because you you brought a very interesting point of view to, uh, to the conversation, so I think that's 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 why we're doing these. So I think that's sure. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So it's appreciated. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, yeah, I I really enjoyed it, and lovely getting to hang out with you too. <laughs>